Radio's first decade was a good one. In 1924, more than $350 million were spent on radios and tubes and related hardware. In five years, that figure would more than double. And furthermore, car radios began to appear. RCA stock went up 600% in a year and a half in the late 20s. CBS stock didn't go that high, but the network did achieve solvency, thanks to the efforts of Bill Paley. Radio listening, particularly in the evening around the living room set, was becoming a habit for millions of families. A habit that would last as long as network radio. We offer one who has the will to win. Victory is his habit. The happy warrior, Alfred E. Smith. In 1928, the presidential conventions and elections were carried from coast to coast. And since no one knew what was just around the corner, everyone seemed to have a good time. I don't want you to uh, uh, think that uh, it's any wonderful honor to be asked to introduce this gentleman. I knew knew this gentleman. That's why I can be rather familiar with him. I knew him almost in childhood. I knew him when he first started in nominating Al Smith. (laughs) We must must have some 80 or 90,000 people here tonight. That's the most people that ever paid to see a politician. Now let's look at the record. Prohibition has found a new line of endeavor for the underwild. They brought life to the bootleggers. And the bootleggers begot the hijackers. And the hijackers begot the racketeers. My friends of the radio audience, the only cure for the ills of democracy... It's more Who democracy. Who is the man that is running against each other this year election time? Explain that to me. Herbert Hoover, Vesuvius Al Smith. Herbert Hoover, Vesuvius Al Smith, huh? Yeah. Another thing I'm going to ask you. I, I don't know if I was going to be a Democrat or a Republican, you know it? How does your old man vote? Well, Papa used to always vote for the uh, Democrat. Well, then if I was in your place, I would vote for the Republican. How come? Because I never know your old man to do nothing right in his life. Well, it's breakfast time in the Burns home, and the ham is just coming in from the kitchen. His wife is already at the table. Good morning, Gracie. Good morning, dear. Breakfast is all ready. Good. Did you notice the new, uh, the new couple who moved in next door? I'll say. He was out in the yard taking a sun bath this morning. Yeah, I don't blame you for looking. <laughs> Guy's got the sort of a figure that women like. Not me. I'd much rather have your figure. You would? Well, oh, sure. If I had his figure, I'd look like a man. <laughs> and that's Gracie Allen, the lady who put salt in the pepper shaker. So when you picked up the wrong one, you'd be right anyway. Now, if you should ask me, I think that radio's finest hour has always been the comedy hour. I'm Jimmy Wallington. And I've shared a microphone with almost every star of the golden age of radio, starting way back when. The Fleischmann's Geese Star, directed by Rudy Valley. I hope everybody, this is Rudy Valley and Company. The Fleischmann Yeast Star, Rudy Valley's great variety show, will have to go down in radio history as a launching pad for many comedians such as Jack Pearl, Milton Pearl, Edgar Bergen, and Joe Penner. <laughs> Hello, Rudy. Hello, Joe. How are you? You want to buy a duck? No, Joe, I don't want to buy a duck. Why? Why? Because. Well, uh, maybe your brother would like to have one, huh? I haven't a brother. Uh, well, if you had one, you think he'd consider it? No. Under no circumstances? Under no circumstances. You nasty boy! Eddie Cantor first appeared on The Valley Show way back in 1931. It wasn't long before Eddie got a show of his own. And NBC put me on as his announcer. We were really feeling our way because no comedian had ever worked on radio at that time, just on the stage and in vaudeville. Well, pretty soon we found that I had to be more than just an announcer because it wasn't enough for Eddie just to tell jokes into a microphone. He needed someone to talk to, to bounce gags off of and make fun of. So I became his straight man. Must have succeeded pretty well because Eddie and I worked together for 26 years. If the market takes another slump, 
I know thousands and thousands of married men who will have to leave their sweethearts and go back to their wives. Nowadays, when a man walks into a hotel and requests a room on the 19th floor, the clerk asks him for sleeping or jumping. For a while, I announced the Jack Benny show, too. But then we put our heads together and decided Benny ought to have his own straight man. A fellow named Don Wilson was put on the show. You know how long that lasted. Ladies and gentlemen, as we look in on Jack, Benny, and Mary Livingston, Mary is opening a letter she has just received. Who's the letter from, Mary? Where did I open it, Jack? Oh, look, it's from Mama. Really? And what does the worst years of your father's life have to say? <laughs> During the Depression years, I don't think radio won any awards for public service or journalism or public affairs. All that would come later. But radio certainly brought a lot of laughter to a lot of people who needed it. For instance, the bank holiday paralyzed the economy of our country. But Amos and Andy paralyzed the entire nation. When the country went on daylight time back in the 30s, a lot of factories changed their hours so people could get home early enough to hear their show, which was sponsored by Pepsodent in those days. see me about, Kingfield. Uh, Brother Andy, I was looking for an insurance company. Now, uh, tell me this. Uh, what is your burial plan? Uh, excuse me for protruding, but what is that again? Uh, Brother Andy, I have got a, I've got a burial policy here that takes care of all the arrangements for the departed at the time of sorrow. Uh, coffin, flowers, two coaches, and many other things that you will enjoy. <laughs> and the interesting thing about Amos and Andy, they didn't give too much. They, uh, sat back and give, gave about three or four jokes a night. But they would spread it out in a slow, casual way. They were easy to listen to. And they be became the biggest thing in the country. This is John Royal, vice president of NBC in charge of programming throughout the 30s. He remembers when the two comics were personally defended by NBC's first president, Merlin Aylesworth. We went down to a hearing in Washington before some senators uh, uh, on the matter of education. So our president said, Amos and Andy is the most uh, educational program that you could get. So one senator said, well, Mr. President, how do you account for that? And our president says, they have made more people in the United States use toothbrushes than all the dentists in the country. At first... Comedy shows didn't have a live audience, but it didn't work out. Without laughter, the shows fell pretty flat, and somehow the timing was off. Eddie Cantor, Jack Benny, and Ed Wynn were the first to have a studio audience. And for years, Ed Wynn actually wore a fireman's helmet as he portrayed the Texaco fire chief. Can you tell me of the Townsend plan, which is to give a pension after you are 60 years of age, applies to women as well as men, signed, anxious. <laughs> Dear anxious, the Townsend plan is strictly for men. <laughs> You ought to know they'll never get a woman to admit she's 60. <laughs> so many careers got their start in those days, but usually in kind of a small way. But in 1929, in Baltimore, I got interested in a radio station down there, WFBR. The uh, announcer would request... Anyone who could play an instrument, sing a song, or even play a pair of spoons should come up and they put them on the air. And I sang a song called I'm in Love With You, Honey, and some idiot liked it, and that started this career. In case there's anyone left alive who doesn't recognize this voice, it's Arthur Godfrey. My first programs on the air at WFBR found me billed as Red Godfrey, the warbling banjoist. I used to get fan mail addressed to the warbling banjoist, some of it to the wobbling banjoist. <laughs> but I was only there for about a year, and then I was, was attracted to, quote, the big time, unquote, and left WFBR in Baltimore and joined NBC as a staff announcer in Washington. Light up a cremo, a mellow mild cremo, a winning smoke by far. You can search every climb, but at three for a dime, you can't beat a cremo cigar. La da 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 da
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the sweet-scented cigar-smoking society. This is Arthur Godfrey down in Washington, D.C. Mike Man Godfrey, Cremo's capricious custodian of the calorific cantata. I remember for a while I announced the RKO show around 1931 in New York. They had a theme song that went something like, Hello, hello, the RKO is sending out its message so the world will know. One night a young man appeared who had been told to come all the way from St. Louis to do the show, where he'd been doing a split week on the RKO vaudeville circuit. Well, he looked so disgusted, I asked him if I could cheer him up. He complained that they dragged him halfway across the country, and for what? Who was going to hear him on some little skit on a half-hour radio show? Well, it was obvious he didn't know anything about radio, but he went on anyway. And that was the first broadcast ever done by Bob Hope. Thanks for the memory of sentimental verse. Nothing in my purse and chuckles when the preacher said, for better or for worse, how lovely it was. We who could laugh over big things were parted by only Sometime during the decade of the 30s, the comedy writers, those undercover geniuses of radio, discovered that a good argument was a great way to build jokes. And the radio feud was born. Remember Fibber McGee and Marilla Trivia? McGee? <laughs> yeah? How would you like a big job on the city payroll? Oh, he'd love it, Your Honor. Yeah. Good. Report to the zoo tomorrow morning. You can wash the elephant. Good day. Charlie McCarthy and W.C. Fields. Hello, Mr. Fields. Hello, blood poison. <laughs> and now, do you feel sorry that you said I was full of termites? I guess I do. I guess I do. I really haven't had time to give it much thought. You know, Charlie really loves you, Mr. Fields. Yes, I do. But I don't think Mr. Fields loves me. Now, listen, that's gone far enough. <laughs> I've been a gentleman up to now. Hope and Crosby? I guess that one's still going on. Well, first, I'd like to hear you sing. Okay. When the blue of the night meets the gold of the day, someone waits for me. <laughs> well, what do you think, Mr. Hope? Let me see your feet. <laughs> My feet? Why? Yeah, with that voice, you'll make a wonderful grape crusher. <laughs> and the classic... Jack Benny and Fred Allen. It was always tongue-in-cheek and always rehearsed. But I've always wondered about this particular evening. On our stage, we have a Hoffman pressing machine. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. An expert operating the Hoffman pressing machine will press your trousers. Now, wait a I wish someone would put out an anthology of radio humor and make sure to include all the supporting players. On the Catter Show, for instance, we had Park Your Carcass and the Mad Russian. The McGees had all their neighbors, Doc Gamble, Wallace Wimple, the postman. Remember the old-timer used to say, That's pretty good, Johnny, but that ain't the way I heard it. And all the famous Allen's Alley characters. Here's Carol Carroll, who wrote the Kraft Music Hall and a lot of Bob Hope's material. One day, Rudy Valley called us up and said, I've got a man here who has just come over from Denmark. He's going to do a warm-up for our show. And Victor did his famous punctuation routine. And I have yet to see an audience as fractured as that audience was. It was so great that the radio show just simply could not follow it. And it lasted about 20 minutes. So we got with Victor, and we said we would like to use him the next day. And he went right through a commercial, which we didn't get on, and he went right through a song by Bing, which he didn't get on, which didn't get on, and right through another guest spot, which didn't get on, and another commercial, which didn't get on. We got off the air just as he finished the routine on this tremendous laughter. We knew we'd hear from the sponsor, and we did right away. He said, sign him. 
<laughs> I'll teach you the system. A period sounds like this. Here is a dash. An exclamation point is a vertical dash with a period underneath. Here is a comma. Quotation are two commas. If you happen to be left-handed... Question mark is rather difficult. <laughs> and there were so many other shows. Stoopnagel and Bud. Vic and Sade. Lum and Abner. The Goldberg. The Great Gildersleeve. Duffy's Tavern. Red Skelton. Henry Aldrich. Maybe the critic's own choice is the former juggler from Boston who made us laugh and also made us wonder just what it was all about. His name was Fred Allen. Uh, pardon me. Are you Mr. McCarthy? Uh... Yes, yes, I am, yes. I saw your ad in the Hobo News, and I've come to see about the job. Yeah, well, frankly, you look like the kind who would answer an ad for a ventriloquist, yeah. You may have heard of me, Mr. McCarthy. My name is Fred Allen. Yeah, the name is familiar. You aren't wanted, are you? <laughs> no. Well, tell me this. Are you, are you new in radio? New? Why, bless you, my little man. I was in radio when you were just a gleam in an acorn's eye. That's uh, that's ring music. I thought so. You know, there's something about you I like. You know, I think I can do great things for you. Well, tell me, Mr. McCarthy, when we work together, will I ever get any laughs? Well... Maybe just one little chuckle? Maybe. Oh, sir... You are a prince. <laughs> Let me kiss the hem of your tuxedo. It's a tailcoat. <laughs> I shall throw you the kiss. <laughs> yes, this is the NBC Radio Network. Alexander Wolcott, the town crier. The sound of his bell is a signal that he has taken up his stand once more at the great crossroads of the world. This is a very rare transcription from 1933. I know it's my job to tell you the news, as I noted in the passing crowd. To talk of people I've seen, plays I've just attended, books I've just read, jokes I've just heard. But tonight, for a change, I've a pilgrimage to propose. I jingle my bell in the hope that all who feel as I do about such things, all who find solace in the remembrance of things past, will go with me. I want to make a little journey in opposition to that mysterious and relentless factor we call time. I seem to hear the music of an earlier day. Isn't that a lovely radio style? I know of no one on radio quite like Alexander Wilka. Back through the years, back through the depression, back through the boom. Back to that smug time which someone had the impertinence to call normal. Back to the... Army. You know, during the Depression, Will Rogers remarked that we were the only nation in history who went to the poorhouse in an automobile. He might have added that we also had a cake of soap and a toothbrush. There's no doubting radio's role in improving our personal habits and our standard of living. It was on radio that we learned about halitosis and B.O. and something called... Regularity. Some of the big spenders among manufacturers sold cars, complexion care, and coffee. And believe me, some of the commercials were elaborate, if not terribly spontaneous. You take Maxwell House coffee in that can, what you've got to use the key on the top there. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, that is something. Yeah. That's what real fresh coffee is. No monkey business. Boy, that's good. You is right, Melissa. That is good. So good. That's why Maxwell House coffee is the best. So let's have another, another cup of coffee, and let's have another piece of eager. Ah, give me a piece of pie, eager, 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 This campaign is more than a contest between two men. 
It is more than a contest between two parties. It is a contest between two philosophies of government. Franklin D. Roosevelt, having received more than two-thirds of all the delegates voting, I proclaim him the nominee of this convention for President of the United States. The new president had broadcast fireside chats when he was governor of New York. I know, I used to announce them up in Albany when I was with WGY in Schenectady. But this was a new style of radio for a president. To many Americans, it seemed as though the president was talking directly to them. I want to tell you what has been done in the last few days, why it was done, and what the next steps are going to be. The bank holiday, while resulting in many cases in great inconvenience, is affording us the opportunity to supply the currency... In 1933, after the election, the newspaper publishers decided that radio had scooped the press once too often and closed their wire services to the networks. They even demanded that the daily radio schedules that every paper carried free of charge be considered paid advertising. The result was war, a real-life feud between the press and radio. And CBS and NBC found themselves suddenly in the business of getting their own news. What we did was we gathered the news really by telephone. We had 100 or 150 stations on the network. We had the teletypes. We alerted all of them to tell us of what was happening in their area, if it was anything very big, very important. This is Abe Schechter, who was director of news and special events at NBC throughout the decade of the 1930s. And, for instance, the New York Police Department has now and had then, I guess, what they call a, a teletype or a communications bureau. And I used to have a regular system. I'd give them Rudy Valley broadcast tickets, which was the big show in those days. Uh, we weren't so far behind, and when they called us, then we'd follow up on the telephone. And if you called the sheriff or the chief of police and some community a couple of hundred miles from here, and you said, this is, you know, calling for Lowell Thomas at NBC. God, they talked to you for hours. They'd be delighted to tell you what happened. Uh, for instance, there was a big milk strike in Iowa. The reporters were sitting outside the governor's office for hours and so forth. We'd put a call through and get the governor on the phone. He'd tell us what was happening. Just around the corner, there's a rainbow in the... We interrupt this program to bring you a news bulletin. Flash, a plane has just crashed at Floyd Bennett Field in New York. Details will be broadcast as soon as they are received in our newsroom. We return you now to this evening's program. Have another piece of pie. Let a smile be your umbrella. For it's just an April shower. Even down the rocky cellar. Well, that kind of bulletin probably would not be aired today. But we did used to do it. And it was an inkling of the future power of radio news. This was a lesson we learned, I think it was in New York many years ago. Immediately, everybody was flooded with phone calls, because anybody who had a relative flying, they didn't know which airline. Secondly, uh, the police or somebody said the roads were clogged, they couldn't get through. But on a local station, you can gum up the complete rescue operations. The broadcast of the decade was on May the 6th, 1937, when the luxurious new Hindenburg was to have made a routine landing in Lakehurst, New Jersey. No one was there to broadcast it, but Herbert Morrison of WLS in Chicago was anxious to experiment recording news for delayed broadcast later on, which he thought would be easier and cheaper than stringing telephone lines for live broadcast as they used to do in those days. He had with him, for this reason, a disc cutter and an alert engineer. They passed notice of the ship just holding it... Uh... Just enough to keep it from... It's burst into flames. Wait, wait, wait. Get this, Charlie. Get this, Charlie. It's rising. And it's rising. It's rising terrible. Oh, my. Get out of the way, please. It's burning and bursting into flames and, and it's falling on the morning fast and all the folks between that this is terrible. This is the one of the worst catastrophes in the world. Oh, it's... It's, 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 it's rising. Plenty. Oh, four or five hundred feet into the sky. And it, it's a terrific crash, ladies and gentlemen. The smoke and the flames now. And the flame is rising to the ground. Not quite to the morning mass. Oh, the humanity and all the prayers are just beaming around here. I told you. I can't even talk to people. I, I can't talk, ladies and gentlemen. Honest, it's just laying there a mass of smoking wreckage. That's terrible. Needless to say, the future of recorded news was assured. On the next record, you'll be hearing Henry Morgan 
and some of radio's best and worst dramatic productions. This is Jimmy Wallington. Hope you like the show. Thank you.